Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. You have worked with in a system networking area was uh, five or six years ago, and um, actually I knew Anish uh, from way back uh, in the good old days of Midwest, and we spent quite some time as faculties at the university. Um, now, uh, m many of you actually here are working in sensor network, and uh, we all seen many, many papers working on very interesting but theoretical problems, with a few notable exceptions that there are a few people or a few teams who are actually willing to go out to the wild and to actually fiddle with hardwares, very flaky hardwares. And uh, Anisha is actually going to tell us one exception which they actually have built, uh, a network of a few thousand sensors. And uh, I'm just amazed to look at those pictures, and it's eerily familiar. Uh, remind me of some of some of things we did at the 29 Palms when we were working with uh, with the Marines, and it's just a wonderful experience to be out in the wild. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to this uh, Anish share experiences with us. So with that, Anish. Thank you, Frank. So you know, it's always a pleasure to uh, work with my colleagues at Microsoft Research. So I've been doing this now for several years, and a highlight of my year is coming back here every year and spending more time with them. So thank you for this invitation. So the last few years have really been uh, different. And um, let's see, can we get set up here? And we got a chance to do uh, uh, what I would have preferred to call a large scale experiment. But DARPA likes the term extreme scale. Maybe I can give them some justification for why they chose that word. Uh, so this program called NEST aimed to produce sensor networks which were several thousands of nodes. And the target was 100,000. And somewhere in the program, they thought maybe they can even do a million nodes. Meanwhile, it turned out that these experiments were having a hard time scaling from 10 to 100 nodes. So they decided to set some kind of a limit as to what the program could achieve. So the target was going to be a 10,000 node experiment. And for a, for a variety of reasons, I got to run that uh, that project, which was called Extreme Scale. So I'd like to give you, from this somewhat broad uh, experience, uh, some elements. I hope to do some justice to it. Uh, uh, and let's see, let's see how far we get. Please keep the questions coming. So really, this is uh, one person speaking, but there's a large team behind it. And I should like to acknowledge some of them in more detail uh, later on. So um, you folks are truly exposed to this area. So I guess this is just a few slides of warm up. Uh, just to set the stage, and then we can get into some more details. So as you know, the idea is we'll map uh, a sensing or a control application to do uh, some processing based on observation from one or more sensors. And the attitude has been the sensors are somewhat generically chosen. In fact, you get to freely postulate the sensors. You're not limited to a given set of sensors. And based on those, and based on shared uh, communication with uh, uh, with your neighbors or the rest of the network through one or more communication interfaces, you can take some decisions which you can actuate through one or more actuators. Now, energy is a key problem. It may be, as some people say, the problem. So you would like to fine grain the power management of each of these components, the processor, the sensor, the actuators on the network. Um, security is becoming a problem. And so sometimes in this node, you would actually like some hardware and, of course, software that supports uh, the security of the communications. And uh, there is a supposition out there that so far, we've only gotten to the point where we can do uh, observation in a robust way. But when we are actually scaling to do, uh, to do actuation, then the applications should multiply dramatically. So um, an example of a sensor, um, you've seen this. It's called outside homes. It's uh, a motion sensor. It's built on technology called the passive infrared, sometimes called the pyroelectric infrared. And so basically, it's looking for a difference in temperature. So imagine that there's a bunch of beams in its field of view. The field of view may be somewhat limited in terms of its angle 
uh, both in the, in the x, y, and z planes. Um, and whenever an object passes through, it will interfere with the beam. And that temperature difference will create some kind of an electric current. So this sensor will expose uh, some knobs. And one of the knobs could be the um, sensitivity. So in the case of a person, by varying your sensitivity, you could get uh, a varying range from a, a small number of meters to, say, 15 meters. So you have this, um, this thermal signal converted into an electrical signal. And this signal can now be conditioned in the hardware uh, to be, you could do some, uh, some gain control. You could do some noise elimination in hardware. Perhaps you can do some kind of detection in the hardware itself. Uh, and that information you can pass uh, to the processor by converting it. And that information can be sampled at the, at the rate you desire to run your software application, which in our toy example of a single PIR could be detecting and perhaps classifying what type of object crossed through the PIR's field of view. So here is a somewhat benign data set. It's taken from the desk of a colleague of mine at Crossbow who sent a person walking through uh, his room uh, three times. And here you see the deviation of the signal in the absence of the, of the target and in the presence of the target. And so looking at this, it seems one could do the signal processing somewhat easily. But when you go into a somewhat more realistic environment, you see that the signal in the amplitude domain looks much more messy. So here is a human. And again, it's not particularly clear, just based on simple thresholding, where the human might be. And for a car, that becomes even more uh, confusing. So the question is, what kind of features and what kind of domain you should like to do the signal processing in? And here is a very quick uh, uh, report that for this particular case of distinguishing a human from a car, perhaps some kind of frequency domain analysis might suffice. And what one finds is that whenever a human goes by, the energy content of that human is concentrated in the frequency band somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5 or 2 hertz, whereas when a car goes by, that energy band is uh, in a larger uh, range. So it goes up to something like somewhere between 2 and 8 hertz is whenever a car goes by. So we've got a basis for classifying these two types of objects even on a single node. And the, the more robust um, implementation of that could be after you remove the initial noise, you pass it through the appropriate band pass, and then do some kind of thresholding to be able to distinguish uh, a person from a car. And given that one little sensor I showed you, it seems that the ranges we could deal with for a person are about 12 meters, and for a car, about 25 meters. So this was about as well as we could do with this, uh, with this very simple logic. Now, of course, as you all know, this area has been active for 40, 50 years, uh, the idea of detection based on sensing. And the traditional concept was using one or a small number of sensors, which were doing some kind of complex signal processing. So here is some data about a particular vehicle. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tank at, at an Aberdeen Proving Ground, this data set. And in fact, by looking at the signature, you can identify which particular type of tank it is. But that's the approach one would use if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of processing power on a, on a single node. And the field tries to look at the alternative of given a bunch of nodes, given a dense set of sensors which are network, how can you solve the same problem which, with humbler signal processing? And that changes the focus from signal processing to some extent on networking and distributed computing and their impact on the signal processing application. So one can look at a variety of features. And you know, Feng has done uh, pioneering work in what kind of distributed uh, information features would be of interest. Here's a simple one that we used in some of our early deployments. So we've been doing deployments since 2002. And this one basically said, uh, the sensor out here is a magnetometer. And we send objects carrying some metallic content on them. So here is a person carrying some metallic content when you define that as a soldier for DARPA. And Right. And just a few meters besides the person is the, the area in which the sensors can detect that uh, soldier. And so if we had a dense deployment, we can look at uh, the size and uh, the shape of this influence field by cooperatively looking at the sensors that detect the soldier. And if we get that larger set um, of nodes which detect a vehicle, we can distinguish uh, a vehicle from a soldier 
based on the simple distributed uh, classification concept. So here's a very biased view, and I think a, a lot of you share this particular view that the field has focused on uh, applications. And one of the good uh, outcomes of the applications have been that uh, they have focused attention on the baby step but critical problems that we need to understand in order to realize these applications. So over the years, and my dates, of course, you might uh, view differently depending on your experience. Over the years, the problem that has been sort of a core problem has sort of uh, has evolved. And some of these we now regard as being more solved than others. And some of you in this room have contributed in a significant way to, to bringing uh, the state of the art here. The other thing we've learned is that we don't truly trust the fidelity of, uh, of simulations. And formal models um, exist only in trivial form. So we really don't have a predictive basis for design. And this has been very frustrating for those of us who really like clean models to simplify our design. And so experiments have been the way for us to understand um, how can we gradually try to um, make uh, application development um, with high fidelity through simulations and formal models. But at this stage, we've been doing it in a somewhat painful way uh, and just trying to understand what environmental variabilities there are and what uh, device unreliabilities there are in a proper way. And there have been lots of surprises in this process of experimentation. Regularly, one has experienced that as you go from uh, one dimension of scale to the next one, um, you have to, in fact, make some uh, phase transitions in, uh, in the types of protocols or algorithms that could work. So here's a very biased view of how, how scale may have evolved. And I'm sure this is, uh, there are some exceptions to this. But so in my experience, I've seen the number of nodes scale over the last few years. The area for the dense sensor network case has also grown um, somewhat more uh, rapidly. But perhaps another interesting evolution has been in the complexity of the program. So from very simple applications to, um, to doing more interesting signal processing and more interesting coordination to now perhaps in uh, our last experiment dealt with uh, programs on, uh, on the mode type hardware which had gotten to about 200 kilobytes. And on the, on the microserver or the Stargate type uh, devices, our programs have gotten also to be somewhat uh, complex. You know, one, one could have fitted some uh, non-trivial operating systems into that space uh, uh, several years ago. So uh, by the way, this number is somewhat inflated uh, uh, because of uh, some not too intelligent reuse of libraries. So it, it probably is, is about half a megabyte or so, but even then, the point being made is that these programs are becoming uh, complex in their component uh, depth and in the interactions. Victor? So I'm, I'm just surprised to see that you don't actually have a column which talks about the power consumption as well, but energy consumption along with these things. Uh, absolutely. I think um, uh, so increasingly the lifetime issue is being forced. Uh, the early deployments probably lasted uh, single days. Uh, at this point, it was probably three or four days. And now I think where we are approaching is about the 30-day. And on paper design, we've approached uh, the six-month uh, mark. But it is clear that the user need, in some cases, is significantly longer. So the proper design of the hardware and of the power management and software has to now address multiple years. So one is already using the 10-year uh, design as a, as a requirement. So as a... Uh the processes have gotten power more powerful. You say mm -hmm. the energy consumption uh, has gotten better, actually. Right? Well, uh, no, I yes. think I think the the algorithmic focus on how to do um, how to do low duty cycle operation across layers and how to do maintenance across layers has gotten better. So that that's just folded in into this complexity increasingly. Uh, and I guess what I'll give you is a snapshot of where we've gotten on that. But again. The limitations we had took us to about 30 or 38 days. Um, and we know easily how to extend it to about six months at this point. Feng? Yes. Can you actually say a little bit more about yeah, the failure rate? On the previous slide, you said as the scales goes up. Sure. Um, does the failure at a higher rate, or what are the equivalents? Absolutely. So um, one of, the, one of the data sets I'll report is the yield from X scale across various layers and and so one of the things I'd like to point out in this talk is uh, failures across um, 
just uh, component failures coming out of the box, failures out of the factory as to failures in configuration, failures in deployment, failures in localization. So I'll provide some data uh, and see what perhaps what early models are coming out of this. Uh, so Feng, perhaps in, in about 30 minutes we get to that. So uh, the scenario is something like this. Um, the scenario is that um, the, the, the sponsor in this case is DARPA, and they're looking at uh, putting this uh, sensor network tripwire over an extended region. So the assumption is that there are these uh, wide areas, uh, deserts, uh, maybe even uh, a forested area, where it is still possible for there, to be, uh, for there to be activity of people, dismounts, or vehicles. And you would like to A, detect that this has happened, classify it in real time, within uh, a small number of seconds, and to provide some modest fidelity tracking. Um, ideally, if you can get some initial localization within a few meters, but then if you're, say, within several tens of meters, you can still have uh, an adequate response to tracking these intruders. And the focus is to take it to um, a long region, which in some sense is linear. So the width of it need not be uh, terribly large. Now, the, the scenarios they have in mind are, for instance, protecting uh, an extended pipeline over several hundred kilometers. So it turns out uh, that there are breaches every year which cost the US government and other nations uh, a significant amount of money to repair. Sometimes one fears the breaches are by the people who fix the, the pipeline. Uh, but in any case, one would like to know that this is happening and fix it early. Uh, then again, there's been this issue of tessellating a border between two countries to see that there is unauthorized activity going on. And the third scenario, I guess, was uh, pretty topical last year, where the, the valuable asset in this case is activity going off a road. So often you find that uh, the normal traffic is staying on the road, but occasionally someone gets off, in this case to implant some kind of uh, an improvised explosive device, and one would like to detect that there has been activity off road to, um, to, to sort of prevent uh, troops from going through that region. So the experiment we did uh, was uh, to see if we could build a 10,000 node network across uh, a 10 kilometer by one kilometer region. This was the, the, the patented goal of the experiment. And I was given about 15 months and we finished uh, our, our step towards this in December 2004. What we ended up doing was covering a region which was about one kilometer by uh, several hundred meters. We put on the ground over a thousand uh, moats in, in fact, this exact number is about 1,200 moats. Um, uh, we also ended up using, not connecting these directly in a flat one-tier network, but we ended up using a, a microserver uh, type layer above to form a backbone network. And the ideal number of nodes would have been something like uh, 40 or so. But our, our goal was to prove that we could cover the 10 kilometers, so we went ahead and put all 200 nodes to study how the scaling of the backbone, uh, this mesh network, would uh, be successful. Um, it took us about 15 months to design the, the hardware, uh, the, the protocol stack, and the application, and the deployment, et cetera. And we got about two weeks to lay out the network and to keep it alive. So laying it out took about a day or two, and then we got to experiment with it for about 12 or so days. Uh, so this was a large team effort, um, and fortunately, Money was not a large problem. We were still pretty constrained, but it was not a large problem. And the problems, in fact, that we had were the sort of the policy issues. So along the way, it seemed like the uh, popularity of this, uh, this type of work had sort of uh, been acknowledged by different parts of, the, of, of defense and uh, the armed forces. And so the US is concerned about this technology leaking to other nations. So they've classified our software as secret. Um, they actually did some things to prevent the visibility of this experiment. So usually they bring in these professional crews to take videos. They invite the generals. This time it was just a bunch of 15, 20 techies and some customers who would use this, uh, this output. And so right now, um, and, and they also did not give me access to my 10 kilometer island. I had a beautiful island which uh, I think Jeremy wanted to fly over at some point. This is white sand beaches in Florida. It was, you know, we spent three months trying to collect environmental data from this place. But finally, when push came to shove, they didn't give us access to that island. They gave us access to this forest in Florida where there were rattlesnakes and no logistical support. <laughs> uh, 
And, and they also told us, you know what, uh, you go ahead and deploy it yourself. So there were some challenges along the way. But from my point of view, I was still able to prove, I believe, that it works for one kilometer. And because of the backbone argument, which I'll try to spell out later, it actually should work without any surprises for 10 kilometers. And so right now, we are transitioning the, the software um, and, and the domain knowledge to a military integrator. And sometime this year, they expect to do the full 10,000 node experiment. So that's just uh, the um, sort of the, the high level overview. Uh, yes. I mean, it's all classified, I, I take it. But um, can you make some general remarks about there's a lot known about you know, MASH and multi hop and all that stuff right. in the community. Did you have to do significant changes to what is known to make this work, or perhaps stuff that is known generally did right. work? So, so uh, Victor, by the way, I can freely speak about the algorithms. The software has been classified, but the publications have not. This is kind of interesting. All I'm prohibited from doing is using my own software to build another system. But I can also do experiments comparing uh, my software with other people on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, our concerns were, when we were doing this, that uh, at least at the mesh networking level, we were looking at a 30-hop network with a latency requirement about uh, one to two seconds end to end, and a reliability requirement in the high nines, something like 98, 99%. Uh, and it wasn't clear to us that the existing uh, mesh networking protocols would work. So uh, the strategy was to actually have, uh, to try out what ideas we think will work and to have a, have a baseline from the mesh networking community that we could use if our effort failed or we could compare it with. So we've done that kind of study. So we've actually ended up with a whole bunch of results on broadcasting, on converge casting, uh, and trying to do management even at the mesh level, which uh, I'll, I'll refer to. I'll, I'll be describing one in detail, and the other papers are available from the website, or we could talk about offline. So still staying at a very high level, the scenarios in this case are, um, um, so we've laid down this 1,000 node, uh, 1,000 plus node network, uh, and um, we're going to walk people through it, and they will be detected uh, and classified by using some of the sensors. And uh, we'll, we'll send uh, non-metallic vehicles, all-terrain vehicles, through this perimeter. And uh, they will be detected by uh, not only the PIR, but also the acoustic uh, sensors. And um, then there were scenarios which, um, which showed uh, not only fine-grained tracking, but also coarse-grained tracking as they covered all 300 uh, meters. Um, and we also had some operator scenarios. I'll just show a quick video here. Again, very unprofessionally taken by, uh, by students who've been working 20 hours a day for two weeks. Uh, let me just move on to something more visual. So this is you know, just sending a person walking through the early part of the line. Uh, and in this case, what we've done is we've configured the system so that all the PIRs are turned off. So we had these management operations where you could change the modes of the system. And so this person goes through the network, and uh, you're not very convincingly you'll see that in this whole area the person is not seen. Then we configure the system so that we activate uh, the sensors. And uh, sorry for the poor quality video. But now this person will start walking through the line, and, um, and we'll see. So here is this person who's been walking through uh, just a few hundred meters. This is the initial portion of uh, the one kilometer. And he's been picked up by the PIR sensors uh, in this case. So we did some experiments where uh, we did experiments at night just to show that the PIR would, of course, work uh, just as well at night. And just rushing through this, we did experiments uh, during the day, it turned out we did experiments during the rain, we did experiments during the wind, and the sand blowing into our face and our sandwiches, which sometimes arrived. Um, OK. So did you run over any sensors in your vehicles in the process of the two weeks? Uh, this was a satisfying story. And uh, an 18-wheeler went over the sensor, a, a row of sensors, and they all basically got crushed into the ground. But the packaging survived uh, the 18-wheeler. The problems we had were, uh, were more along the lines that the sensors would topple. That was a problem because you know, automatically their radio range decreased from something like 30 meters to 4 meters or 5 meters. So that was a problem. The rain, it turned out, you know, we, we had these windscreens which were able to 
to some extent so soak the rain but not let it come in in a big way and when the sun came uh, that dried out so that didn't cause a failure problem. We did have a failure problem that the switches sometimes got loose and so they sort of got inverted so you thought you were switching something on but you'd actually switched it off. So we did have two or three uh, reports of that and some other examples I'll point to at the end. Are these sensors uh, mounted on pole or they're placed on the floor? Uh, on the ground, on the ground. But you know, all we could do is that um, we could try to keep the board a, uh, an inch and a half off the ground. So even that inch and a half gives us uh, a great improvement. So, so w were you constrained to use um, all this unlicensed band and 2.4 gig and all that stuff? Or I mean, this DARPA, right? They have all these lower frequencies. Right. So I don't think we were constrained, but we want we wanted to uh, we wanted to sort of own uh, sort of the outcome. And these were the components we were most familiar with at this stage. So I think some of our decisions were based on what we can manufacture in time and uh, be able to program. So the use of the Stargate platform in particular was a suboptimal choice. Um, and it was suboptimal because uh, the Stargate doesn't have wake up on radio. So I lost the ability to uh, find, uh, find manage uh, the, 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 the lifetime of the Stargate. Um, but you know, the, it, it comes with Linux, and it came with the MSTAR environment, which was fantastic for us. Um, so that was sort of a programming decision, not a, a CONOPS decision. But your algorithms and everything should, should work Absolutely. as well in any of those devices. In any of those devices. A lot devices. more robust and right. much better right. propagation properties. Right. So one of our, one of our, you know, these hundreds of documents, but one of them is a sort of a survey of all the platforms we could have used, and uh, and w what sort of the decision criteria were to choose this one. But yeah, I think the results are quite portable. So uh, now to get a little bit more specific, so our user requirements could be broken down informally into three categories, and the first category is going to be cost, the second category is going to be quality and the third category is going to be manageability. So let me begin with the cost because I think this was the primary concern when it comes to selling something to the military. They just really want to see how this would compare dollar-wise with their existing technology. So our first goal was to see, we want to cover this large area. How can we do it with uh, a minimum number of nodes? And the sensors we were dealing with up to 2003 had these rather small ranges of about seven meters or eight meters. And that was going to be a limiting factor. And the communication ranges at that point reliably were about 10 meters and optimistically about 15 meters. And neither of those on the Moat hardware was going to be enough. Uh, we had to worry about the power and lifetime issue. And we had to also worry about uh, even if we got nodes which had the right sensing and comm ranges, how did we place them properly so that we could minimize the coverage. So the first part of the story was to sort of do a redesign on the existing Moat. And uh, this boiled down to a careful selection of which sensors that were commercially available we could integrate and get some reasonable ranges. So the PIR seemed to be a safe thing to do. Uh, we thought we would get about 15 meters. We ended up with about 25 meters for a car. We wanted to do localization with uh, a, a buzzer. And so we built an adjustable frequency uh, um, um, sort of uh, conditioning circuit for our buzzer. And we expected to get 10 meters out of it, which we did. Uh, but this was supposed to be used for localization. Now, acoustics was going to be one of our sensors. And this is a conservative number. Acoustics, as we all know, is highly sensitive. Uh, also a very complex modality to deal with. But uh, what we were able to show quite convincingly is uh, you can easily get 50 meters and significantly more than that for um, vehicles which have noise larger than tire noise. So tire noise you can probably get at about uh, 20, 25 meters. But uh, for things like uh, diesel engines, uh, golf carts, for example, you should be able to get substantially more. And uh, for whatever reasons, we stuck with the magnetometer. The magnetometer is still the most constrained sensor. And it did affect the density we had to go, to go with. And in retrospect, this was not a great decision because its power consumption is still among the highest of the whole lot. And what it gave to the customer was not uh, terribly large. Um, so we, we had to redesign the, uh, the, uh, the impedance matching for the antenna. And it turned out that gave us a larger range. 
And we also had to do some interesting onboard design for integrating the sensors and for making our system a little bit more reliable. I'll point out a couple. So one thing we wanted to do was to keep our sensors largely off. So to do that, the idea was you, first of all, you make this, the, the signal conditioning as tunable as possible, but you also throw in part of your detection circuit into the hardware. So a low-level wake-up happens in the hardware, and you can then do hierarchical sensing. So your most active sensor, the microphone, can, for example, pick up the early detect and then decide whether it wants to trigger the PIR, which in turn can then decide whether to wake up uh, the magnetometer. So this was the conception, and this, these circuits were included in the hardware. The other, the other problem that we had with uh, the moat is that on a moat, you run only one application. The operating system is bundled with the application. And if the application misbehaves, we don't want to lose that moat permanently. So there has to be a way of recovering that. And as trivial as it sounds, I mean, we had to incorporate uh, a hardware watchdog which would force the exit of the moat from its application into uh, a check which says, uh, can the network inform me whether I'm in a good enough state to continue? So a granite timer it was a, a, a hack by which we could always recover a moat. And the concept here is we don't want to be touching moats. We definitely don't want to be looking at health on an individual basis. So there should be some way in which you can bring malfunctioning nodes uh, into a safe state from which you can reconfigure the network uh, into uh, an ac acceptable application state. And there were some other uh, hardware modifications. So this is uh, what the board looks like when it's uh, vi visible. And this is a board, uh, um, an enclosed mode, which has been subjected to a few rains. Fortunately, you know, only some of these PIR windows are caked with mud, but we still have some uh, angles which we, with which you can uh, still get some robustness going on here. So the second issue was uh, on this notion of cost. So we are giving a sensor which has a large sensing and comm range, relatively speaking. This will only get better, we hope. But you, you want to minimize the number of sensors that you're placing on the ground. And the, the, st the traditional view has been, well, you know, we'll just deploy nodes randomly. Right? And randomness is great. But it comes at a cost for the number of nodes. And if you do an asymptotic analysis, you'll put in log n times more nodes than you need to put if you're deploying things randomly. And by the way, in most dispersals, nodes don't fall randomly, especially if you're outside. In a building, if you're sort of following the map of the building, the deployment might not look as uniform as you would like. But yet you have a map you can access. In, in the field, when you deploy nodes, they have to be less than featherweight for there to be any randomization effects. So I've seen experiments where nodes are deployed from uh, a helicopter or, an, uh, or a, an aerial vehicle, and they fall quite precisely on the ground along the line with less than few inches of variation from their ideal falling spot. Yes, miss? So I'm just wondering, even you initially you deployed like in a regular grid, but uh, like a wind blows them off, they might uh, end up with in random position. Uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, this, uh, so just to reinforce this point. So the idea is you should plan your topology, but you should also plan the amount of error in the placement. So first of all, the people who are placing it are not really going to walk in these perfect lines. Uh, so, but you can define a, a type of a crop duster distribution which says, what is the error in the x and y plane relative to your ideal locations? And you can include that error in your planning. right? But uh, I guess the, the thing I was saying was the supposition that the placement is random is excessive. You can model the deployment error in your planning stage and, and compensate for that in your coverage design. Right? Yeah. So indeed, indeed, our nodes will be placed. Uh, so our design was to place nodes within 1 or 1.5 meters of their ideal location. And by the way, we never blew them off within inches of where they were placed. Okay. Right? And we had heavy winds. We had winds that you know, we could hear. Uh, and it, that's another story which I'll get into. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, the point is, like, uh, I agree with you, it's efficient to deploy in the regular grade. But yes. the have to, like, for the oh, so this is an excellent point. Okay. You sh you're placing in a, in a planned way, but your management has to prepare for a completely unplanned structure. So your system is going to go into states you haven't predicted, and the topology is one of them. Right. So you always have to have safety algorithms which work for arbitrary graphs. Right. And in fact, all of our algorithms which exploited structure 
also had a fallback mode where they would still produce correctness for an arbitrary graph. It's just that for the planned case, they would be much more efficient. Right? So that's a great point. You cannot assume in the design of the system that the, random, that the, the planning will be successful. Yeah? But that, that you should say is your common case. Uh, so we, we decided to place our moats in a grid. And if you're trying to do a point coverage, uh, then you can figure out what's an optimal grid placement. And in this case, it turns out uh, a triangular lattice is the best placement. So we've placed these, the moats on these dots in a triangular lattice. Now, our overall structure is a grid, but it turns out we have more density on the outer part of the perimeter and less density as you approach the high value asset that's being secured. And the idea was as the, as the target enters the system, you should be able to classify it and track it in a fine grain, get a bunch of readings as it crosses through this part of the line. And then you could figure out some kind of a bounded box uncertainty as to where the target is. And you'd only get the coarse grain uh, uh, tracking in this uh, inner sparse region. So with this kind of a structure, we, we yes, Victor. I'm not sure if I, um, maybe I missed it, but uh, one of the another advantage of having high density uh, deployment up front is you can uh, trigger your wake-ups and make sure certain certain parts of your sensors are open, or certain exactly right. areas of your sensors mm -hmm. are open and the others can still sleep. That's exactly right. And in fact, that was part of the conops, but we didn't implement it. So, so the idea is, let me explain the idea, I mean, re-explain your idea in two ways. So we've designed this for point coverage, but you can also design it for barrier coverage. Your goal might be to say, well, one simple form could be to say, as an object crosses this network, it should be covered at least uh, a few times. And the moment you use the barrier coverage idea, you can decide to, to make several of these sleep. In addition, as Victor pointed out, um, you, can, you can sort of send these look-ahead signals into the areas that you think the node is going and wake them up in, uh, in anticipation of that. And the challenge is to now make sure that the communication structures are still going to wake up in time in order to be able to exfiltrate the data within the one to two seconds of uh, the target uh, reaching that point. So, so there is some cross-layer implication of, um, of that, uh, that phased activation. Yes? Just, just you know, give, give me some data. So the, uh, the front, the dense, they populated the grids. Uh, what, what's the space in between them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I am rushing today. I can always slow down here. So these are placed uh, nine meters apart. And this was designed based on the, the inaccuracy in the placement. And so what one is seeing here is that the nodes should be able to sense, even with magnetics, they should be able to get point coverage in between these two. But if we didn't have magnetics, we could have placed these up to about 30 meters apart. So the real density we're looking at right now is somewhere between 10, I, I'd say 20 is, is if I were to redo this network, I would have used about 20 today. And the rest of the network is spaced about 45 meters apart. Right, so these lines are about uh, 45 meters apart. And I haven't explained what these triangles are. They will end up being the stargates, which are the higher level network. Oh, right. I see. And I was just going to motivate that in the next uh, slide. So each row is actually also covered by these uh, modes as well, in addition to these triangles. Right. So the idea is on the thin lines, You've got, uh, you've got modes as well. And a lot of these rows which you're seeing which don't have modes were only because I wanted to do my 200 node experiment to prove that the protocols would scale. When I stretched these stargates from being 45 meters apart to actually being uh, 135 or 270 meters apart. Um, and uh, so maybe I could tell that part of the story there. So since they weren't giving me my 10 kilometer, what I could do was experiments in the test bed where the stargates were placed a meter apart. And I could do experiments in Florida where the stargates were placed 45 meters apart, 90 meters apart, and another larger multiple of that. And I could show that my protocols exhibited the same patterns across these various uh, power ranges and densities. And so that gave us some confidence in predicting that they would, uh, they would deal with uh, a larger scale. And for the larger scale, what we just did was we created a thin, line, a thin line, so we had the airport at a higher state, and so we put things across uh, one and a half kilometers, about uh, 300 meters apart, and then ran a much smaller version of our protocols to see how far we could go. 
But we haven't done a 10 kilometer thin line. We just didn't have access to that resource. Victor. So when you put them one meters apart, you're actually, I assume, uh, not only are you reducing power, but you're putting some attenuators? Yeah, we've, in our test bed, we put physical attenuators. So the, you know, about the least you can do in our case is about two, two meters or so, reliable range. So in my test bed, I, which uh, is about um, um, 25 meters by about uh, 15 meters, I can still get about seven or eight hops in the test bed. Right. The other question is, um, what was your requirements on the throughput for the backbone network? Oh, yeah. This is a nice story. Um, so, you know, one thinks that uh, if you're using the 802.11, you should have access to this um, one, you know, megabit per second uh, rate on all of these devices. So you should have reasonable throughput. Uh, across this 200 node network. Uh, we were finding it hard to get more than one hertz communication per node out of the system. So that was our stress case at this point, to get uh, one hertz. Every second, each of the 200 nodes is producing one, uh, one message. So, and that looked like, I don't know whether I can really say we couldn't have done much better, but this was a challenge for us. Now, it turns out that was adequate for our, uh, for our conops. Right? But at this point, we're not really thinking of streaming with the protocols we have. But we certainly have to handle bursts coming out uh, of the network. So no, no high frequency, but low frequency communications with periodic bursts was our design. Did you, sorry, did you yeah. turn off auto rate completely? Were you uh, running yes, like, yes, so you yes, we did. One, the lowest rate there, one megabit on per node. Yes. So that would give you the longest range, but then you were putting attenuators and lowering the power. This is in the physical test, but not in the field, yes. Right. Uh -huh. And, uh, okay, now I just want to understand the configuration. Correct. Okay. Correct. So the second part of the story is uh, the quality story. And the quality in this case boils down to uh, how can the system tolerate uh, incorrect placement, failures of nodes, uh, that the comms coming out of the system are still um, uh, highly reliable. They come out within end-to-end. Uh, -end. Our requirement was a detection should happen in two seconds. Classification should happen in 10 seconds. And the user really cannot tolerate false positives because the cost of a false positive is too high. Uh, so you had to be conservative. So it's a funny problem where you want low power, but you still have strict uh, quality and uh, strict quality constraints. So we're really uh, forced to explore the extremal part of the design space. And uh, the way we did this was to say, well, if I've got nodes which are talking 30 meters apart across 10 kilometers, you've got a 300 hop network. The state of the art has had a hard time dealing with five hop mode networks. We don't want to push that. Last year, we didn't want to push it. And so we had to introduce this higher tier, which would give us comms, which were about, um, uh, which was several hundred meters uh, long. And we would try to optimize many of our services to exploit this uh, topology. So basically, the story is we've decomposed um, the handling of a group of about 20 to 50 XSMs by associating them logically with some uh, higher tier device, in this case, an extreme scale Stargate. Um, so an XSM is an extreme scale moat, and an XSS uh, was this device. Now, this isn't a logical association. If failures happen, this will get uh, remapped onto uh, some neighboring um, Stargate in that array. And now this mesh network will communicate with uh, the higher tier backbone. Now a Stargate, in this case, the XSS, consists of uh, the Stargate. And it's uh, attached to it through its USB is uh, a GPS receiver. So that ended up being the localization story we used uh, at the XSS level. <coughs> uh, it's got a high power uh, 802.11b wireless CARN. And uh, with the proper selection of the antenna, as you can see, in something not particularly stealthy, so about a meter and a half from the ground, we've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, a 19-inch uh, 8 dBi collinear antenna. Uh, packaging is waterproof. Uh, it has onboarded uh, one moat. Uh, it should have been an XSM, but for form factor reasons, we went back to the older Micro 2. And so we had these 200 Micro 2s in addition to the 1,000 XSMs out there. Uh, but, you know, we were basically using it for just as a, as, a, as a glorified radio 
it didn't have uh, any sensing going on it, so that difference didn't matter. And so the interesting comment here is that this was our, uh, our power source. And I was really worried, even with this all year, that I wouldn't get more than a week's uh, utilization out of the network. Turned out we did end up getting our 30 day, because we really forced the question of uh, energy savings in the protocols at tier two. Um, and yet, we didn't have this way of putting the, the receivers to sleep and waking them up uh, based on radio. So had we done that, I, I think we could have done something interesting here. So this is a throwaway part of our experiment. Now, tier two, uh, you basically want efficient comms coverage, so we put it in this grid. And this grid separates each of the excesses by 45 meters. Now, here was a big debate in, um, in, in the whole design. So the big debate was, you know, we can only run, we have, uh, we have this um, limited memory, uh, we have, you know, limited program space. Why don't we choose the optimal network protocol for all the scenarios in the application? Why don't, you know, for example, we choose a single, um, so here I'm just saying uh, that we had the issue of, well, when you're deploying things, if communication is needed, should that be the same as the communication for the operator application? Should that be the same when you're trying to collect localization data? And should that be the same when you're trying to manage the network? And so what we decided was that uh, each scenario had its own requirement. And we didn't think it was safe to come up with one hat fits all. So we really ended up optimizing the services to the phase. And so our whole uh, application got decomposed into what happens when a node is placed down on the ground and you just want to make sure the network is configured properly. What happens when you're just trying to manage the nodes in their safe mode, in their trusted base or operating system mode? Uh, and we, we separated those. And one advantage of this was that we could change applications in the field. So you didn't assume that the application was pre-configured into the node. And uh, for us, from a time perspective, we, we couldn't limit ourselves to having canned everything by the time the nodes were being configured in the factory. So we could actually experiment up to the last minute and do the configuration on the field. But more importantly, like I said, we optimized uh, each of the services to the requirement of the phase. And what this made explicit was the fact that as this, the application moved from one phase to the next, you had to coordinate the change of the services on all the nodes. And had we not done that, that would have happened implicitly and been a mess. But at least we got to cleanly ask the question, what are the policies for making sure that the next phase can start when some nodes may have failed to move on from the previous phase? And so we had a clean separation between uh, the application managers. And we could instrument what policies they would do. And that instrumentation was changeable. So we could modify the policies as we discovered new failures. So let me, let me repeat what you just said, because I think it's a very mm -hmm. common so if you're saying, um, given the scenario, a certain set of things were more optimum for that, and you chose to go that route rather than build some sort of general mechanism, yes. right? So uh, in the whole sense of networking field, and Frank kind of knows this too, for several years mm -hmm. this has been a big struggle, right? Which is sort of like, okay. is, is this, when you deploy real systems, would you rather build something which is you know, specific so to that So vertically integrated, yeah. yeah. And it seems that from your experience now that you build this or deploy it, you've really concluded that that is the right thing. It's not about generalities that a lot of people are trying to sort of I think this would be the absolutely interesting question to come back to in 10 years. But I had no choice. No, but the thing is, right. five years ago, mm -hmm. when it started, there was the same question was raised, right? Right. And, and right. So in fact, the vision was even more glorified. The vision was, I will have one service that's tunable across multiple platforms and multiple dimensions of scale. Here, forget tunability. I don't even know how to adapt one particular right. protocol for its given environment and to deal with its cost layer issues. Those are complicated enough. So indeed, we are trying to expose the knobs. But at this point, we haven't gotten to the point where our services can really uh, adapt across different uh, platforms. Yeah. Um, so uh, to give you one example, when we go to this case when all hell has broken loose, and you use um, the default protocol to see whether what the state of the network is, we're getting only 60 to 70% of the data out of the network. So I have to decide based on that partial data whether my network is healthy or not, because I have no assumptions. But for my application scenario, I really do need that 99% reliability, at least at some layer, 
to be able to give the quality I'm looking at. So there's a big gap between the, the one hat fits all uh, and this more vertical uh, solution strategy. But I, I don't know how the field will evolve. But in any case, what we've identified is that flexibility is a good idea. That you should have, you should allow the possibility of changing your app. And these changes can actually be relatively fine-grained at the level of policies. And we have many other smaller level health components which, uh, which we can also change. So I think it's about 11.30 and I'm about one-third into my talk. So I will, <laughs> I can, I, I, so you'd give me how much time? We can take another 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes, right. So if there are people who have constraints, you should feel free to leave, right. And I, actually, I'll, I think I'll go skipping through some steps. But I did want to give one example of, um, of optimization. So the, the example is that of uh, irrigating the system with a new program. So I have a 200 kilobyte program. I'm going to sort of download this 200 kilobyte program to all of the modes. And so first I'm going to download this program to all the, the XSSs, which will in turn download to their 20 or 50 XSMs each. And so we came up with this service called Sprinkler, which tries to get 200 kilobytes in an energy efficient way. With uh, the goal here, of course, is 100% reliability. If I, a partial program is a non-program. And it should be robust to uh, nodes failing and is optimized for the 2D grid case, but still able to deal with the case where the 2D structure is, is violated. And here it does it with a very small polynomial. It can do it locally in, um, I think, uh, in sort of a, a small function of the degree, uh, whereas in this case it will boil down to an order n cube computation. And the ideas are a throwback to ideas that you may have seen in, in several papers. One, not every node should participate in the forwarding. And we would like to plan that rather than discover that. So a lot of protocols like Deluge and MNP would like to at runtime decide you know, opportunistically which node is the best to get information from. And it turns out they end up using about 70 to 80 percent of the nodes. Whereas what you would like is given the, the amount of density that you have to use about 10 to 15 percent of the nodes. So locally construct connected dominating sets. And the second idea would be do scheduling on these to deal with the interference problem and make sure that your protocol deals with the failures of getting the information across this backbone structure which is connected across the system and from the backbone to the non-backbone nodes. So there's a detailed protocol design which uh, I will skip uh, presenting. So let's just keep uh, going forward. We need a connected dominating set to minimize the number of nodes. It can be done locally. TDMA can be set up locally. Um, and the, the constant overhead of doing this locally is a small multiple of the optimal. So within twice the ideal, you can do TDMA. Sorry, I'm just going to rush through this. The protocol. And in the field, you can configure the, the the sprinkler to discover what the, the backbone separation should be. So what we were discovering in this experiment was that if we operated just outside of the safe, reliable range as a backbone separation, we could minimize the latency of getting the information uh, out of the network. And then we did uh, several studies uh, in our test bed, which I mentioned uh, briefly. So there are about 210. Uh, stargates which are connected to wall power and ethernet and uh, on the stargates we have mounted the XSM so we've got 210 XSMs and from the web remotely you can configure your experiment you can instrument injection of data at runtime and you can get the data coming out of the network uh, and so we were able to use this from down in Florida to be able to debug a lot of configuration errors which was the dominant problem we had sorry I said something separate all of a sudden the dominant problem we had were human errors in, uh, in Xscale. And so, again, manageability uh, becomes forced from that. So we've looked at the, uh, I'm going to skip this. So the final part of the story I was going to tell on the requirements was we had to minimize the human. And the concept was there should be a one touch. But in fact, there were several touches. Uh, we had to do some touching in the factory. 
But even on the site, before uh, we went out to deploy the nodes, we had to retouch the nodes because the factory incorrectly configured the nodes. So we had essentially what was a Byzantine failure from friends. right? And so we had to design a recovery protocol with our management suite to bring the nodes back into that ideal configuration. Otherwise, what would have happened was I would have put the nodes out there, and they would have drained their energy just trying to discover what the right configuration is. There was actually a, an infinite loop because of using sequence numbers incorrectly. So these are friends who can cause uh, Byzantine faults. So you design us to accommodate for that. Uh, and then you had to do some uh, touching. I guess not touching, but after you pick them up, you had to sort of through the network make sure that they had all been turned off. That was one of the, the steps. So I think we are still far away from the one touch uh, moat. We are still looking at about three or four touches, but extreme scale forced the question of how well you can do on that. Now, the, the system is not fully autonomous. It's really a command and control system. So as you can imagine, the uh, commands come from the higher tier to the base stations, and if need be, they go to the lower level base station, and the responses are collected coming back. But in addition to doing that kind of command and control, which would let you change what the parameters of individual components were, and what modes, uh, or what, uh, what particular uh, phase you were in, we also had to design a bunch of application-specific components. So at each tier, Every application had its own manager which could configure uh, policies. And in cases where I really know what, knew what the health correction was for a component, I was able to instrument detectors and correctors with each individual component uh, uh, so as to look out for abnormal states and to do automatic recovery. And all the protocols were designed to recover from, uh, from bad states. Uh, um, and yet we had this, uh, this safety net from the granite timer of being able to recover uh, from pathological situations. So this was just a quick diagram to show that for each of our components, we had these health managers. But then we could also look at their attributes and see what the current state of the components was, change the configurations, and change the policies. So to go back to Feng's question, and I'll try to do this in three or four minutes. The quick story here is um, failure out of the box was there but ended up being only, uh, I think, less than a percent failure out of the box. The failures that we still had, so why is this adding up to about 5% or so, was uh, incidents where nodes, um, where nodes uh, fell off in the, in the wind. There were cases where people picked up a node for some reason and forgot to put it back, human errors. And there were these cases where people going through the system uh, would knock something off. But so although these incidents were temporarily correlated, the data showed that the, the out-of-the-box uh, or the deployment failure was spatially uniform. That's kind of simplifying. Uh, this was uh, a good thing to learn. Now, there's this problem of pumping down con programs into uh, these 1,000 nodes. So how many nodes do you lose because you failed to program them? So here we had unanticipated faults. It turned out our trusted base had some kind of uh, a live lock when it tried to, uh, sorry, a race condition when it tried to access the flash. And so sometimes when you reset the node, uh, it would fail to even start uh, getting into the trusted base mode. And the other interesting observation was a few nodes, even though they were very close to a base station, just refused to get programmed. I can drill down into this, but at a gross level, you have nodes which are just lagging behind the rest of the system. And they could lag behind substantially. So I could program all my uh, 1,000 nodes in about 16 minutes. But these nodes, I think, would have gone on for several hours. So at some point, I had to cut off the, uh, the, re the reprogramming and move on to the next phase. And the cutting off seemed to affect an additional 1% of the nodes that might have completed based on the data. So uh, I think the points here are this failure was unanticipated. Interestingly enough, it was spatially uniform. Um, and the fact that it was unanticipated meant that we had to be able to deal with uh, this by changing the configuration at runtime, by instrumenting the policies at runtime. Did you actually look at the reason behind why it is being uh, spatially uniform? Because you of know, correlations? That there's, there's no correlations between those? Right. So, so, uh, so, so Feng, in this case, 
it's basically a race condition. So the question is, with what probability will you not be able to initialize the trusted base? But and the that program is through the air, right? Or right, reprogramming is through the air, but in this particular fault, the trusted base is not ready to accept the program. In this particular case, what we are thinking is going on is occasionally the battery is running low or the lead is bad, right? And when you're at that sort of that dicey voltage level, you observe these Byzantine behaviors. So we've seen two kinds of behaviors. One, where nodes start chirping a lot. And so for that, we have to instrument uh, correctors which suppress uh, the violation of contract from nodes which are barking too often. And in this particular one, um, the, the node is just not able to, to successfully load a page into Flash. And so it keeps saying, can you give me that packet again? Have you, have you seen any quality of failure that has to do with communication or the programming part which has to do with propagation of the, uh, of the code? No, no. But here's, here is a correlated failure. So we tried to do localization. And localization, as I said, was based on GPS data collection. So all the, uh, we planned to do it with acoustics. Acoustics failed for some other reason. And we ended up getting GPS data from all the stargates and handheld data GPS data collection from all the 1,000 nodes. So sometimes you fail to pick up a data from some node. And then this data that's being collected is being snapped to the ideal grid. So we had a snap to grid program. And that snap to grid program is not perfect because sometimes multiple nodes are mapped onto the same uh, ideal location. And in some cases, when I convey this information back to the nodes about what their location is, the network doesn't get that information to them. And what we found was that the failure in, this, in the data collection and in the snap to grid was correlated. So there would be these, burst, these bursty regions where nodes had been shifted by one position, or where two data points ended up at one location. Now, this was a, a correlated failure because of the particular algorithm we chose. Fortunately, these bursts tended to be in a small size, like uh, one to three or four nodes. And um, the routing protocol was designed so that even errors in, in location would be tolerated. So when you look at the routing data, it turns out uh, at, the, at the XSM level, I'm going to rush through this. We are getting around 87% of data out, which is much lower than we expected. We expected in the high 90s here. But the impact of localization was, uh, was, was not large. It was a marginal impact. So it, it basically made you lose a few percent of, uh, of, uh, of uh, it, it added a few percent to the unreliability for the common case. Now, the, the mesh network worked at about 98% reliability. And what we were able to prove is that we would have gotten 38 days of life out of it. Um, so just to summarize, we had these major requirements. And for us, what seemed to work was planning to not trust on full automation, and yet in order to keep the human in the loop from dealing with individuals, there was some limited autonomy for adapting uh, sensing parameters and adapting the health of some individual components. But autonomy is still the rare case and not the norm. Uh, the hardware design had lots of problems. Analog design still seems to be a, a black art. Uh, we, the major problems we had were in common mode rejection. So essentially what I was having was sample readings which were colored by the current row in the circuit when some dense computation happened or concurrent radio happened. So somehow I had to design the sanitization of the sensing data. And that was a, a hardware debugging problem because we couldn't get uh, the analogs uh, perfect. Lots of failure modes, some because of improper choice or no, improper sealing of components. Some because in the factory, the hardware configuration was wrong. You had to put in the antenna into one of two ports. You put it in the wrong port. Um, the antenna never broke, but it could come off because the bolt could get loose. And um, we found with some hardware components, the reliability was not great. So the GPS we chose had something like a 30% failure. This was, I don't know how these people are in business, by the way. 
Uh, I really don't. Uh, Xscale ran, so this is sort of one of the summary slides, Xscale ran uh, at about 72%. And the purpose of this slide was to say, I began this talk by saying I want to minimize the number of nodes I'm placing on the ground, and yet I had to use some redundancy. And the redundancy we chose was about, crudely speaking, based on these uh, coverages, I put about four times as many nodes as I would have put in the minimum case. But based on this data, I think I could now do twice the region with the same number of nodes in a safe manner. Uh, the human made most of the mistakes. Um, and so making sure that even your management allows some kind of recoverability seems to be, uh, seems to be a key issue. And um, one of the challenges for us was dealing with uh, even device variability which was down at the level of choice of op amps. So we, we bought, for example, op amps from different manufacturers, and that gave us very different behaviors across uh, the nodes. Uh, fortunately, we could debug this before we went to the field, but uh, uh, this was a challenge. And of course, for acoustics, et cetera, you still have to sort of look at the variation from node to node. Some nodes hear better than other nodes, and so you have to do that adaptation uh, autonomously. Uh, the other big challenge was dealing with uh, wind. Uh, wind was kind of interesting. I'll spend one second on, uh, one minute on this one. So wind was a challenge because wind moved the grass, and the grass sometimes moves like a person, and at higher speeds it moves like a car. The wind shook the moat, and when you shake the moat, the magnetic field changes. So you've got to deal with that one. And um, wind had a loud sound depending on the condition of the wind, so the acoustics were sensitive. So the signal processing had to be tuned to, to dealing with wind, and this was a, an interesting challenge for us. Uh, papers, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't really describe the, the core technical ideas, but that is, uh, the papers are appearing here. Our test bed is a, available remotely for external users. Uh, uh, did, go ahead. Yeah. Did, you, did you investigate any into you know, the effect of any broad scale radio frequency interference? OK. Um, Camera? So we've done, we've only done interference studies uh, for um, in-network interference. But we haven't looked at sort of external factors uh, causing a large interference. They didn't seem to be an issue for us. I was wondering from a defense, defense perspective, uh, you know, if, if someone could actually try to disable the system using... Oh, I see. Right, right, right. So, so the issue is now it's a security question of denial of service, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, so we've only done that in research, but none of that was implemented uh, in this system. So Wilf, I can take that offline if you like. Yeah. Uh, I have to thank about 50 people who worked with me on this one. Uh, so this was a great experience. It was a terrible management uh, process, but everyone seemed to, to contribute in, uh, in, in large ways. Um, and I guess I wanted to tell you a story or so before I quit. So. You know, we had rattlesnakes, uh, which uh, at, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning when the generator ran out and we walked into the, the cacti where we had placed our generator so that it wouldn't create such a large sound so that the rest of the network would hear it, we were worried about the rattlesnakes. But the other things we were worried about were sort of hunters. There were about 500 hunters during the course of the experiment uh, going through the system. <laughs> but the largest challenge was this uh, character here. He, Oddly enough, the cows liked the leather lead going up to the battery of the Stargate. So they chewed off the leather lead in a few cases, and we got a little tired of fixing it, and uh, this was the runtime reconfiguration. <laughs> and the other story was, since wind was such an adventure for us in those two weeks, I decided, when am I going to have a network that covers a one kilometer area by 300 meter area? So I'll collect uh, wind data. I'll, build, I'll try to build a model which goes beyond the habitat scale of figuring out are loud regions loud, are soft regions soft, uh, what scales of variation they are. So we worked overnight at Ohio State creating an experiment uh, and uh, you know, tested that in the test bed, downloaded it on the system, delayed my flights by one day so that I could collect wind data for six hours. And guess what? We sat for six hours, and the wind never came. <laughs> So, 
So that's the other thing that uh, experimentation just seems to be highly painful. And the stage I think we want to go into is that we want to be able to do this experimentation inside the test bed. So the way the test bed is set up is you go collect data outside and then you can inject that data at runtime or offline into the test bed and try to see if we can build models in the next few years. Not only for radio but also for uh, sensors. And we think out of those models will come out formal uh, models which hopefully will simplify and make this a little bit more of a predictable uh, subject, predictable design. So I'm going to end here. Happy to take questions. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry about the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when, when we were doing the experiments at the 29 pounds in mm -hmm. the desert, and uh, we put a phone, we actually bought this phone from a local store, which there's only one store in, in, the, in the middle of the desert, which uh, we put it as a windscreen of a microphone. Because mm -hmm. if you don't put a windscreen, the microphone data is garbage. It's garbage. Because, you know, right? And uh, what happened is that the coyotes actually actually chew those because it contained a, a particular chemical called urea. It's like a uh -huh. urine. Oh, yeah. So the next morning we went out there, it all got chewed up. <laughs> right. And so we ended up actually getting a different kind of phone which does not have urea and actually worked well and stayed there for a couple of, uh, for a week for the experiment. We must have learned from you because we spent about, I think, two weeks choosing the phone for uh, the, the XSM. This was a big internal debate. <laughs> So one question I have was, uh, uh -huh. I just had a quick rodent story, or an uh, animal story, as long as you're telling animal stories. So during our um, SHM deployment, mm -hmm. uh, during some of the ex experimentation, we ran dozens of Ethernet cables out to the field deployed modes, or, or no, stargates in some of the earlier versions, so we could get debugging data. Mm -hmm. And it took you know hours to run all these cables every morning. And so we just tried leaving them overnight. And we discovered there were rodents or something in this field that really liked the taste of Ethernet cable. Um, and so we'd come the next morning, and uh -huh. usually a third to a half the cables would be chewed apart, sometimes you know cut in like five places, in just little three-foot segments. So it does seem to be a very common failure mode in these experiments. In these experiments, yeah. right, right. So I think that actually opens an interesting research problem. Mm -hmm. For tolerance against those, or maybe even use sounders or other things to scale them up. Yeah, this is an idea. Uh, it sounds like one has to design a way to anyway. so really understand the background, yeah. Yeah, and more serious a research question. Um, this actually is a lot of work to actually get this thing up through the experiments. If you actually were going to do this again, what are the things that you would actually do the same way? What are the things you would completely redesign? Sure. Based uh, on experiences? Well, um, I would uh, ask DARPA not to classify the research. Uh, I would not work with 50 people. I think uh, we could have done this with about 15. Um, so, so there was um, it's a, a lot of friends working, but just managing the information, making sure that I could hold the ideas together was a real challenge. So you know, I was looking at these 500 task reports with about three or four messages a day on, most, on, on many of them. So that became unmanageable. In, in, terms, of, uh, in, in terms of the design uh, or the implementation, I think very strong, very strong configuration management was necessary. So uh, we, because our time was pressed, we ran many concurrent experiments in different parts of the networks. So folks would set up their configurations in different parts but not clean up properly. And just discovering that there was a configuration problem, you had to know which attributes to look for uh, in order to figure that one out. That, I think, should have been sort of a managed process. Uh, um, So design-wise is, so the thing that worked for us was uh, always having a working system. And uh, we, we had a baseline early on, and we would keep trying to, on two-week increments, trying to refine the baseline. So that process, I think, I would really recommend, uh, which you probably all already do, uh, but not to take any risks uh, towards the end. So we did have this problem with acoustic localization, where we waited a little long on that one. And our baseline of this handheld human deployer was uh, fitted in the last uh, month and a half or so. So that was very stressful. Uh, so I, I don't think the challenges were technical. The challenges were really management uh, uh, in people and in sort of operating the system. And the takeaway also for us was that management is a key research problem, that uh, you're expecting these systems to, be, to evolve and, and to be maintained right now with the human in the, in the loop, 
and what the right set of functions are. So it turns out the management software we have here, as I was saying, still gives us this problem of only a partial look at the network. So how can I really take a decision with uh, flaky data? Uh, that one we are, we are only starting to understand now. Should I define the problem away by saying, if I keep working on the management service, the reliability will be good enough, uh, and this won't be an issue? Or how can I, you know, what is my, my, what is my methodology for discovering and uh, cracking the problem if the network is unreliable? So the, the management quality here is about 67% reliability, and that, I think, was a real issue. Yeah. All right, let's thank uh, Nish.